the most dangerous collectibles of the 80s, banned in schools replete with controversy and toilet humor. A set of trading cards that made 10-year-olds feel like they were walking around with a pack of smokes rolled up in their sleeves, ready to throw down in a switchblade fight. The more parents hated them, the more kids had to have them. Hi, I'm Dan Larson, and this is the history of Garbage Pail Kids. In the 1930s, after supply lines were cut off due to the First World War, the American Leaf Tobacco Company changed its identity and switched to a more reliable and increasingly popular product in chewing gum. The business was reborn as Tops and in 1947 introduced Bazooka Bubblegum. Wrappers for Bazooka Gum featured full-color comic strips, a marketing approach it was known for until just a few years ago in 2011. In the 1950s, Tops packed their gum with trading cards featuring Western stars. Shortly thereafter, Tops started making baseball cards and that became the primary focus of the business. Along the way, Tops produced non-sport candy and trading card products including Batty book covers, flying things, wanted posters, funny travel posters, garbage candy, Mars attacks, and wacky packages. They developed a relationship and reputation with a whole slew of underground artists of the 60s and 70s producing incredible work. All of them using the same visual language, all working with a gross, weird, monster visual vocabulary. They were able to reach the same audience that Mad Magazine was having so much success with. Wacky packages in particular were a series of cards that parodied consumer products like dish soap or cereal or batteries or even Topps' own bazooka gum. They were first introduced in 1967, returned in 1973 through 1976, then again in 1985. Meanwhile, in 1983, Coleco introduced the world to a line of dolls called Cabbage Patch Kids and, and I don't think I'm overstating this, people liked them. In a single year, Cabbage Patch Kids dolls, clothing, and various other licensed consumer products sold nearly two billion dollars. Nearly two billion dollars worth of merchandise, that's a lot of stuff. That's a very large pop culture and media presence. I don't care what your brand is, you're going to get some pushback on that. Topps recognized an opportunity to get in on the action one way or another. Late in 1984, Topps attempted to acquire a license for a series of Cabbage Patch Kids trading cards. Coleco and the original creators of the Cabbage Patch Kids, original Appalachian Artworks, thought that the line of cards were far beneath the high-end branding of Cabbage Patch Kids. You think you're better than me? They couldn't reach a deal with Coleco, so instead of trying to pursue that, Topps launched a parody line instead. As part of their Wacky Packages line, they had already conceptualized a Cabbage Patch Kids parody card called Garbage Pail Kids. Len Brown, creative director at Topps, Stan Hart, new product development supervisor, and art director Art Spiegelman, who at the time was also working on his Pulitzer Prize winning graphic novel Mouse, had a meeting. Creative consultant Mark Newgarden had done the rough concept for the Cabbage Patch Kid parody card for Wacky Packages that was ultimately illustrated by John Pound. Art and Mark would go on to be the editors and creative directors of the Garbage Pail Kids line, tasked with trying to find a way to stretch a single gag out into a full line of 44 cards. This is 44, right? Several artists were considered, but John Pound's proposals had the look, the feel, the sense of tone that fit the best. And they gave him just two months to produce original paintings for the first 44 cards that would be featured in the series. 44 five by seven full color paintings in 60 days. If my math is correct, that's 11 paintings a day for four days and then a substantial rest. <laughs> They doubled the amount of character names, two per card, giving the series an A and a B line, meaning that there were twice as many cards to collect. A total of 88 cards in series one, which at the time they assumed would be the only series. How long could the gag actually go on? They asked in the comments. The packs of cards were sold for 25 cents each, which got you five cards and a stick of gum. Series one was a huge hit and, and I don't think I'm overstating this, people liked them. Convenience stores, gas station, candy shops, packs sold out as soon as they could stock them. As fast as they could stock them. <laughs> when it became clear that they were going to be able to do a second series, the timeline became even more aggressive, and it was clear that John Pound, despite the desire to have a single artistic voice represented through the line, was not going to be able to keep pace with the amount of art they needed. More writers and artists were brought in to assist with production, including Jay Lynch, Tom Bunk, and James Warhola. Garbage Pail Kids were so popular that they were banned from schools for being a huge distraction. They were like the Fruit Ninja of 1985. Are kids still playing Fruit Ninja? Did kids ever play Fruit Ninja? Roblox? Is Roblox the new Fruit Ninja? 
Garbage Pail Kids were so hot. Topps released six full series through 1986. Every time a newspaper or television program ran a story about the potential negative implications of selling this kind of garbage to young kids, it was like a blaring siren telling kids to go buy more. That's what punk is when you're a 10 year old kid, buying toilet humor trading cards because it bugs your parents and teachers. Down with authority, death to the establishment. Hey, who took my gum? However, in May of 1986, Topps was sued by original Appalachian Artworks, who had licensed the Cabbage Patch Kids to Coleco for copyright infringement, complaining that Garbage Pail Kids were doing real damage to the Cabbage Patch Kids brand, making the dolls less desirable. The court ordered Topps to immediately stop production until a judgment was rendered. Topps argued Garbage Pail Kids were fair game since it was considered parody. The judge disagreed, saying that there was a fine line between parody and piracy, and that difference here was that the cards themselves were a money-making venture based on the value of another intellectual property. There was no inherent value in Garbage Pail Kids without the actual value that already existed in Cabbage Patch Kids. Pay up and shut down. Instead, Topps agreed to alter the appearance of the doll characters featured in Garbage Pail Kids to make them aesthetically distinct from Cabbage Patch Kids. They would implement obvious, real design differences and change the logo so that any remnants of inspiration from Cabbage Patch Kids could not be carried forward. Fewer fingers, the dolls had to be rendered as being a harder material, not the soft fabric of Cabbage Patch Kids. The eyes changed, the hair changed, the basic shapes of the head and limbs changed. 1987 was supposed to be the year that it all paid off for Tops and the Garbage Pail Kids. A live action movie was released to actual movie theaters, some of them, on August 21st, 1987. It's the kind of thing that you have to see to really appreciate, but I cannot recommend it to anyone. It was a critical and commercial flop. It cost $1 million to produce and barely made over $1.5 in its entire run. The movie was released on DVD in 2005, but seriously, don't. Just put your money and the time you might spend watching it directly into an actual garbage pail. To coincide with the movie release, an animated series had been developed that was going to air for the 1987-1988 season. 13 episodes were produced, with the more extreme themes of the trading cards significantly toned down. But TV affiliates balked as parents groups and religious organizations lobbied hard against the brand. Even though the show was completed, it never aired. Like a cosmic stick of irony applied directly to the eyeball of the team at Tops and the makers of the 13 episodes, CBS instead ran episodes of Muppet Babies. That said, all 13 episodes were released on DVD in 2006, or you can probably check it out here on YouTube. By 1988, sales had begun to dwindle away. No fad that burns hot that fast lasts very long. In December of 1988, the line was canceled. Series 16 was in production but would not see release for 15 years because in 2003 Garbage Pail Kids returned and the all-new series made up largely of artwork that would have been featured in the 80s but was never released. Series 2 was all-new art and marked the first time that Garbage Pail Kids would be released without gum. Five more series would be released through 2007. They would take a short break for 2008 and 2009, but as of 2010, Garbage Pail Kids have had annual releases in one form or another, theme sets, online exclusive pieces, and a multitude of other merchandise. What began as a hybrid product, a spin-off of their own brand, and a parody of another would go on to be one of the longest-running, most successful pop culture properties ever created by Tops. While they can never be fully divorced from their inspiration, they have become their own entity with a future that no longer depends on parody of the line of dolls, but parody of everything else on the planet. Thanks for watching. Please hit like, hit subscribe if you aren't already a subscriber. Thank you very much to those of you who are. Share this video. If you're in a position to help the channel grow, please visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash toygalaxy. Let us know in the comments down below what your GPK namesake is. Dan was featured for the first time in Series 1 as Drippy Dan, but I also claim Diaper Dan and Dental Daniel both in Series 5, and Damn Dan in the ninth series. I'll also take Danny Ketchup, a par parody of Ghost Rider in the 2014 Series 2. You like Greaser Greg or Grillin' Greg? Grillin'. Grillin', yeah!